السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو ویوز آن نیوز آئی ایم تیمور شامل دی انڈین ایٹراسٹیز ان انڈین اوکیوپائڈ کنٹینیو اینڈ وی ہیو سین دا وے پیپل ہیو بین ریزسٹنگ ٹو دی انڈین ایٹراسٹیز ان انڈین اوکیوپائڈ کشمیر واٹ ہیپن ان لداخ وی نو دیٹ دی شیم دیٹ انڈیا فیسڈ ایٹ لداخ اینڈ واٹ ہیپن ایٹ لداخ ناؤ جسٹ ٹو وینٹ آؤٹ دے اینگر وی سی واٹ انڈیا از ڈوئنگ آن دی لائن آف کنٹرول ود پاکستان اینڈ واٹ انڈین فورسز ہیو بین ڈوئنگ ود دی انوسینٹ پیپل in Indian occupied Kashmir. We also saw how a grandfather was killed in front of his grandson in Indian occupied Kashmir. He was killed by the uh, police, Indian police in Kashmir. And interestingly, they just wanted to change the whole narrative and debate and discourse around the killing of uh, the grandfather. Uh, but this is very uh, understandable because this is what the Indian media keeps on doing. with the facts that are happening, with the, with the situation that is going on in Indian occupied Kashmir. They want to fabricate it. They want to tell a big lie to the world. But that lie was exposed by the child himself, the three-year-old. He told the world that what actually happened. We're going to see uh, what the child had to say about the killing of his grandfather and this killing of the innocence. This continues. We'll look at the sort. And after that sort, we're going to continue our discussion on the atrocities that India is committing in Indian occupied Kashmir and the threat, by the way, India is facing when it commits such kind of atrocities and genocide in Kashmir and elsewhere in India. Did you have a big father in the morning? Yes. What did you do? He was killed. What was he killed? Who was killed? He was killed. So I'm just wondering, when we look at this innocent child and when he'll grow up, he'll grow up with those, those things in his mind, the way his grandfather was killed. He was innocent. He was killed by the Indian police. This child is innocent. His family is innocent. And the people of Kashmir, how they have been killed just like that. each and every day, each and every moment in Indian occupied Kashmir. We'll be discussing about this. We'll be discussing about this, the draconian laws that have been uh, uh, made by the India and Indian occupied Kashmir in our show. We are joined by Dr. Walid Rasool in the studios, renowned senior uh, Kashmir expert and a leader of uh, the Kashmir movement that is going on. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rasool. Uh, we'll also be joined by Air Vice Marshal Ikramullah Bhatti. We'll also be joined by Andy Vermont. Uh, he's an activist uh, from Belgium, Belgian human rights activist. We'll also be joined by uh, Mr. Kamar Chima, lecturer from National University of Modern Languages, Islamabad. We'll be joined by our guest, but I'll just put this question to uh, Dr. Rasool. Dr. Rasool, this video that we just saw, uh, the way that innocent man was killed by the Indian forces, how do you see this killing and the way they wanted to fabricate the discourse around it, the way they wanted to fabricate the facts. How do you see this? Actually, this child is a fifth generation of our Kashmiris in the play. And it is really a gory incident what India, her intelligence agencies, armed forces, and the military actors are doing in the valley. Because they are tagging the situation with the collateral damage and they have killed it on the same parasology lot of the people and I think it is not the first incident some 7,215 children from 20 from uh, uh, 8 to 22 has been killed and this is the consistency of that policy number one number two when an there is a frustration in Indian forces that they have not been killed the resistance movement despite they have raised the degree of oppression up to the quantum then they cannot go more than that and this is an ultimate ultimate degree of any aggression by a so called democracy. Number four this is an icon that resistance will, will be continued by that, I would say generation, 23 years. Yes. When a children is in a position, when he is married and he gives birth to a offspring, right. that is a generation. 
Now this child who is speaking, are you speaking his confidence despite his grandfather who has mm. killed it? Mm. He is confidence. And same is the constituency of the resistance. Actually, what happens in the conflict? The aggressor thinks that more I will kill and more will be the less resistance, but it is it is it is 90 degree opposite. For example, more the people right. kill, more the constituency of the pain right. increases. Hmm. And that pain is an actual driver of the resistance in the Kashmir. Right. This is a very important point and I will get back to uh, you on this point. The same happened by the way with, uh, with uh, so many uh, resistance leaders in Indian occupied Kashmir with Burhan Nani for that matter. Yeah. We will be talking about him in a while. We are joined by Mr. Andy Vermont. Uh, he's a Belgian human rights activist. Welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Andy. Hello, my name is Andy Vermoot. Yes, I, I'm, I'm the president of PostVersa. And uh, PostVersa is a European driving human rights organization who is permanently investigating the human rights abuses and atrocities right. by the Modi right. government in uh, Kashmir. So I hope the terrible image of sitting on an older man uh, who died, and I really find it terrible to see. I'm in shock too, and, and that's something that stays with me. It's really uh, unlawful what, what happens. But the human rights abuses and massacres in Yamu Kashmir are real. It's, it's all, all in, in Brussels, Europe. The whole international community is searching uh, for a fair solution. In our capital city of the European Union, we are really ashamed of what happens there. A lot of uh, Karmiri citizens are much more deserving or trustful support than a lot of other countries and other areas that can only blame themselves for their problems. So with hundreds of thousands of political prisoners, Yamu Kashmir is becoming one big maximum security for all these Kashmiri people. And within the terms of the Yamu Kashmir Public Safety Act, I'm really ashamed that they can do it unlawful without being punished. Many inmates are held without substantiated charges, and despite the issuance of release orders, the Kashmir citizens are a survivor of India's failure to recognize the country's rights of self-determination and the right. time of its own establishment. Right, and so Mr. Vermont, really, uh, right, and European Union is def the defender of human rights. Well, that is exactly, uh, uh, that is what is uh, the soft power of Euro European Union. But when it comes to uh, Indian occupied Kashmir, in your article, you rightly mentioned about why I I European Union should uh, urgently start a probe into the violations of human rights in Kashmir. Do you think that yes. this is important at this point, and EU especially? should take a stand on this while this is happening in Indian occupied Kashmir. Yes, not only this, because I'm a lot of citizens also in Europe and even in the United States are really convinced that Narendra Modi should be judged for war crimes and crimes against humanity by an international competent court. India is actually changing the status of the occupied and Kashmir by forcing new frontier law and setting every part of the there. So I think it's really important that we stick to the human rights defenders, not only in Europe, but also in the United States, especially in Germany, because Germany is becoming of the European Union in this in the next six years. So I'm urging uh, to ask Angela Merkel that she could uh, help organizing an international conference between India and Pakistan to find a real solution uh, for this ever-lasting uh, uh, conflicts uh, where India a lot of atrocities. If you, if you wrote, if I read the Human uh, Rights Report of the United Nations, as some 99% is about atrocities committed by India. And they're still doing it. So it's, it has to stop that European Union doesn't act. We have more than words. So I'm, I have the same feeling that the European Union is should really act, not talk anymore. I write a lot of letters to the European Union and I always get an answer that, oh, it's not so easy. Oh, and we are aware of a lot of things happening there, but we need now not only words, but we need action. 
Right. And Mr. Vermont, do you also think that this is the right time that we should make people aware in Europe about the Indian atrocities in Indian occupied Kashmir and the way, by the way, Muslims and other minorities are being suppressed in India at the moment by the Modi government, by RSS and Shiv Sena? Yes, and I think it's not only a question of the European Union, but also the Security Council and the whole international community should intervene immediately uh, to denounce these uh, against uh, 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 these people living there. Ordinary citizens are killed unlawfully by the state. So this is state terrorism. We have to stop this terrorism. It's not possible that we will still be tolerating such great injustice against the Kashmiri people. We need this intervention. And I think uh, Modi is bringing Kashmir under a total enslavement. We are actually seeing this. This is 2020. How is this still possible? So we need uh, not only this international conviction of uh, the Indian um, uh, actions there, but we also need uh, to, to start the court case against uh, Narendra Modi with all citizens right. who will... Right, right. Mr. Gormont, please stay with us on, on phone call. We are joined by Air Vice Marshal Ikramullah Bhatti renowned senior analyst on uh, uh, the defense affairs and strategic affairs. Assalamu alaikum. Indeed you are Islam. Uh, Evas Marshal Bhatti, uh, thank you for joining us. I'll also welcome Mr. Kamar Shima, lecturer from National University of Modern Languages. I'll put this question to Evas Marshal Bhatti. Evas Marshal Bhatti, uh, we just heard uh, Mr. Vermont from uh, Belgium, a Belgian human rights activist. His stance that EU should urgently start a probe into the violation of human rights in the Indian occupied Kashmir. So we see that the awareness is now coming in Europe that people want, Europeans want to know what is happening in Indian occupied Kashmir and they, they uh, strongly condemn what is happening over there. This awareness that we see globally, how do you see this? This indeed is a very welcome sign and uh, but then uh, it is coming rather late. But as they say, it's never too late. And we, we've seen that the Kashmiris have been suffering, uh, especially since August 5th, uh, a, a lockdown. And of course, the atrocities of the Indian armed forces continue over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, while the Prime Minister of Pakistan and his speech at UNG had highlighted the Hitler and Nazi uh, style oppression that the Indians were in, inflicting on the Kashmiris, and that was for the first time the world uh, had a, a thought that yes, here is a country which is uh, uh, still believing in the uh, uh, mindset of what the Nazis had at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was for the first time that the, the world got to see that in, in the correct perspective. And now we see that uh, despite the corona pandemic, when the world is preoccupied, uh, the, 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 the news is filtering out and uh, people are now getting to see and uh, getting to realize that uh, the atrocities of the Indians are continuing. And another uh, aspect that has added it is the standoff between India and China in Ladakh, which has drawn the attention of the world once again to this region, and which has also brought Kashmir into focus. And now when we hear uh, people from the EU uh, identifying this as a situation that needs their attention, I think it is uh, very welcome, it's very heartening, and it's very encouraging for the Kashmiris, and of course, if they, 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 they mean it, they're serious about it, and that they go ahead and uh, do actually and formally initiate a probe, I think uh, the Indian government, their policies will definitely come under pressure. And they will have to rethink uh, the way they are treating the uh, Kashmiris today. Uh, we have yes, witnessed uh, issuance of 25,000 uh, citizenship uh, documents to, to the Indians who can now move into Kashmir, whereby they're, they're changing the demographic uh, ratios over there, which is totally in violation of the UN resolution and international laws. And this is another thing that the European Union has to keep in account, beside the atrocities uh, on the Kashmiris. And uh, I think this will be very uh, encouraging for the Kashmiris, uh, that uh, uh, for once the European Union has uh, looked at it seriously and they, they are realizing this and they are wanting to do something about it. 
But then it's a statement right now. We'll have to watch and see that does anything physically and actually come about or not. Ji. Right, 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 right. Uh, Mr. Kamar, we saw the grandfather who was killed by the Indian police. And there was this whole drama that was going on around the discourse, around this episode, this gruesome episode that took place in Indian occupied Kashmir and the way he was killed uh, by the Indian police. Initially, they were fabricating the facts. But how do you see the Indian media and, and their distortion of the facts? How do you see it? I think... <clears throat> I think what the Indians have realized over the period of time, and that is to come up with the more aggressive postures uh, related Indian occupied Kashmir, related to Pakistan, and related to the freedom struggle going on in uh, occupied Kashmir. So they believe that the more hard-hitting hard they play, the more social media, the more mainstream media, and the political elite uh, comes up aggressively on whatever is going on in occupied Kashmir, the better uh, it will be for them. So they wanted to get more brownie points, even of the situation which was created yesterday. So rather uh, blaming it on uh, this as an extra judicial killing, rather making this is a serious issue of uh, human rights. And this young young kid who one day could be a freedom fighter, who knows, because uh, his grandfather has been just killed in front of him and he even doesn't know what has happened to him. So rather just like looking from this lens, they are trying to portray as if... Uh, the non-state actors or the freedom fighters or such kind of words they're using that they have uh, killed this man. So I think what is important at this moment that uh, how this narrative is constructed about this entire story. And I think Pakistan needs to exert, exert its pressure because uh, India is facing a lot of pressure from Nepal, Bhutan, China. And I think this is where we need to come up. And I think even if SARC is not working and functioning, we need to call a session for this. If we can talk about the COVID-19, we can talk about this as well. This is a new, fresh uh, understanding of these human rights violations and extrajudicial killings in India, uh, in occupied Kashmir. So what makes the case is that, uh, do we just take this as an incident? Do we actually try to uh, push the global uh, context of Pakistan to monitor and to look what's going on in, in occupied Kashmir? Uh, so I think uh, Pakistan needs to uh, make it more uh, 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 clear to the world. Right. Dr. Rasool, this whole situation that is going on, and your earlier point was very important, how this child, when he'll grow up, he'll think about the whole episode, and I'm sure the, the trauma that he himself has went through, the trauma his family has went through, and by the way, the trauma that every Kashmiri goes through every day, every moment in Indian occupied Kashmir, that is to be kept in mind. Burhan Bani, his brother was, was uh, martyred by the Indian forces. That is how resistant fighters, freedom fighters, that is how they take up arms against the Indian state, state sponsor of terrorism for that matter. How do you see this whole situation? Actually, Yasin Malik Saab is nowadays in the Tihar jail. He wrote a piece that we are victims of Red 16. And I have been the red skin that red 16 in 1984. So this consistency continues, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, people are very much clear, particularly the masses of the Kashmir who think that we have been, our five generations has been deceived. Mm -hmm. It's not me, but their own pro-Indian constituency say so. So when they are the, when they have deceived those constituencies who were always in favor of India, right. what should we expect from them? It's very much clear. Number two, I have wrote a paper uh, that's published in research journal that once the movement starts, the, there is a uh, requirement of the leaders and mm. leaders play a vital role, particularly Gilani Saab, Mirwai Saab, his father, Yasin Saab, our Dr. Fai Saab, they have played a vital role. But during the passage of time, when the atrocities, number of atrocities and degree of aggression increases, mm. it is then pain which drives. For example, if you will convert the entire population of the Kashmir 
there is not a single family who has not sacrificed their kids, kids, years and years. So, this is the big constituency of the resistance now, which is driven indigenously <coughs> and by that pain right. which become the power. Now, what you, what, what you should, we should be, what we should be clear, mm. it is not Kashmir only which is an accident occupied by the India. And 1948, Hyderabad, Junagadh, Gawa, Dev, Daman, Pondicherry, and in 1975, Sikkim, it was occupied by India, northeastern right, right. states of the India. And now, what is the lesson? Lesson is this, that Indian intelligence agencies and their, their political system have created a successful terrorism in East Bengal in the, in the shape of Mukti Bahani. Hmm. Then again they landed LTTE in 1984 right. in Sri Lanka. And again they crippled the all, all internal dynamics of the Bhutan hmm. and then, then they have no, they are independent. So, they have a history policy. of interfering it is primarily. Hist not only interfering, but occupying and brutally occupying and with the, with the induction of hard power. Hmm. That is the what that is the killing of uh, this uh, uh, grandfather right. of the Somal children. Right. It is a consistency, mm -hmm. and we must unveil that how they are they, are, they have been four pronged strategy always when they were have been occupied and annexing the Somal states mm -hmm. which have been independent since 1985 or before that. Not only those independent states, but she has the history to. To, uh, to have some sort of to create and havoc in other countries, right. even, even Balakot in our day, create the sovereignty of the Pakistan has been crippled. Now, what but we all, have they also saw the bipetic yeah. response over there. And now, right. now what, what is, what is dear, why Modi is so much mad, hmm. why he is so much fascist, why he is, he is out of his conscious. Actually, he cashed that, he cashed that constituency which is based upon the hatred and against Pakistan. And the people who voted, they voted on the basis of, and, and, and Modi government is banking on the same vote bank. So, he is banking, banking on, on uh, Gujarat, what he yeah. did in Gujarat, yeah. that is on his record doing what he has to do and, and he is doing as a, as a Prime Minister as well. Evas Marshal Bhatti, talking about this whole situation, Recently, the Indian government has been giving domiciles to Indians and they would be settling in Indian-occupied Kashmir. Now, this is to change the demographics of uh, Indian-occupied Kashmir. Once they are on it, rather they are on it, they are working on it and they are, they are just trying to change the dynamics and uh, demographics over there. How do you see that this can be used strategically against Pakistan or against the Indians? What are India's designs when they change the demographics in Indian-occupied Kashmir? Well, you see, as per the UN uh, resolutions and international laws, the Indians cannot do this. It is illegal. And of course, it is now an opportunity for Pakistan to play it up or bring it to the notice of the international institutions, the UN especially, and all, uh, to all the world powers. And uh, hopefully, look forward to an intervention and an advice to the government to stop this from uh, proceeding any further uh, on this. At the same time, we know that why would the Indians be interested in, of course, uh, changing the demography. Firstly, of course, they would like to uh, uh, bring in an element of population which is uh, not in favor of uh, separation uh, or independence. And uh, uh, secondly, of course, if as and when there is to be a plebiscite, uh, if India does agree to it, then, of course, they should have an uh, adequate number of uh, people who would be uh, voting against uh, separation or against independence and they would vote for India. So, I think these are the two objectives that the Indians have in mind when they go ahead uh, with this new law and, and its, its execution. And which, of course, as I said, is against the international laws and the UN resolutions. And, uh, um, and they do provide an opportunity. Uh, not for Pakistan alone, but the rest of the world to can notice of and intervene and prevent India from going further on this. G. Right, right. And Mr. Kamar, uh, Indian media is owned by 
the, the, these people from the far right, from extremist RSS and Shiv Sena parties uh, by the BJP people, the, uh, the massive disinformation industry that we see in India. Their role is to distort the facts and figures in Indian occupied Kashmir, to tell a big lie to the people. What role is Indian media playing in collaboration with BJP, RSS and Shiv Sena? <clears throat> well, you see uh, in India, which speaks for the BJP and for the RSS, and uh, in the local Indian language, uh, it is, this is known as uh, Godi Media, which speaks for the government, which speaks for the the political leadership, or which speaks for the uh, for for the top-notch uh, politicians of the ruling party. So uh, this Godi Media in India is uh, is a, is a media which targets even the Congress. Forget Pakistan or forget they are making the case for BJP. Uh, forget they are making a case for uh, the ruling party. They are ta targeting the opposition party. Normally, media supports uh, um, the opposition in, in, in uh, against the government. But here, the media speaks for the government and targets the opposition. And above all, you know, the way uh, the BJP government has come up that uh, they have uh, created slogans, anti-nationalist. They are calling the traitors those who want to have dialogue or want to talk to Pakistan or those who believe that we need to get engaged, uh, we need to be soft uh, and we need to find a collaborative approach uh, for the region and those even who are targeting uh, the uh, those who believe that uh, the, the, the Prime Minister Modi couldn't speak well against China, especially mm -hmm. when the 20 soldiers were killed at the Galwan Valley. So they even calling them anti-nationalist traitors. So I think even the, the Sena voices or the good voices or the voices which are moderate in India, they are facing a real challenge to, uh, and that challenge is that they cannot even speak because they are called as traitors. So I think what matters at the moment is that uh, the Indian media, which most of the time uh, speaks for or carries the Hindu nationalist jingoistic uh, perspectives of the ruling party, uh, they are making a narrative uh, that uh, the division within the society where uh, Hindu-Muslim divide is there, but Hindu-Hindu divide they are creating so that mm. those who are... Uh, those who believe that we have to incorporate the Hindu uh, ethos of the Hindu religion into the statecraft, and those who believe that we need to incorporate uh, the religious uh, the religious elements uh, uh, into the constitution, they should be appreciated and accepted. And whatever the Prime Minister right. Modi does, even it is right or wrong, it is projected as if uh, that is the voice of the nation, and they use the word mood of the nation. So the mood of the nation is to go against Pakistan, mood of the nation is we have to boycott China, boycott China. You know, even the, even the government didn't take up this mantle that we have to boycott the Chinese products. The media took this initiative and the government had to follow because there was a widespread uh, perspective within the society that this will be a popular narrative banning Chinese apps and creating space which is uh, anti-China. Rather, right, right, one point right, three, okay. right, Mr. Kamar. This is about the Indian media and the situation that is going on over there. Dr. Rasul, uh, the embarrassment that India faced at uh, Ladakh, just to balance that, they have also been supporting terrorist organizations in Pakistan. We recently saw the Karachi Stock Exchange attack. Now, what India wants to do is that, that they want to finance and support the terrorist organizations, as you were saying earlier, rightly. The way they have been interfering in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and other places, they have been interfering in Afghanistan. They have been financing and supporting the terrorist organizations like BLA and Two TTP. Two friends, East and West. Yeah. How do you see that? There's this multi-pronged uh, strategy of India. Actually, it is a strategic one. Recently, uh, an, uh, uh, data was shared by uh, Stockholm Research Organization. They say that Nowadays, the, when Modi government came again second time in the power, now the defense budget of India is $71 billion mm. as compared to $12 billion of the Pakistan and in which agen intelligence agencies are getting $9 billion. So they are, create, they are hatching militancy, they are creating terrorism and they are concealing Front in front of behind behind democracy. This is what we have to be cautious. Mm. 
in media sciences in agenda setting theory we say that it is not about what to say but what to say about it is interplay hmm. of media modi media and soft power and hard power hmm. so so why we have to be very much cautious we must give our enemy that we must be very much cautious about enemy what she is doing hmm. and we should not be we should not neglect that they are creating some cells hmm. which are heavily funded by the indian soft power because of the 4 trillion dollar economy hmm. we have to be very much cautious about it secondly it is not the only our armed forces which are defending islamic republic of pakistan mm. it is people within people within the pakistan who have to be very much cautious about these terrorist elements mm. and number three mm. they are trying to give the message that we have some sort of access in the shape of the terrorism mm. so the dovel dactarian the mm. present uh, national security advisor of the modi he is a he is a cunning and little person and definitely uh, modi it was all by design that modi injected him him and empowered him in the in the in the corridors of but, the power but but my question is that how difficult it is becoming even for the bjp government itself for india itself to to support these terrorist organizations to do what they are doing with the uh, uh, kashmiri people in indian occupied kashmir with the muslims in india is this working out for bjp is this working out for rss is this no, working no. out for india for that matter actually you see if uh, the people who have uh, who have the subject of indo pak relations they well know that there are muslims and within uh, muslims are the 22 240 million hmm. and there are only 18 Uh, this parliament members which has been and uh, not not a single in the bjp right this is the one fault line of the india it is not the small amount it is 22% of the indian so population so inadequate representation yeah. of muslims number 2 dalits hmm. number 3 christians six and same is the situation they have these fault lines and up to the quantum that even even a brahman elite brahman Uh, he he doesn't allow to he will never drink a water uh, in the tap where is it is locality of the in this Dalits, Dalits. Hmm. and Dalits and recently recently I think five or four six years before just such a was with me in the Washington we were having in the conference and he to he he was he was given uh, this toss by the government that he will frame a commission. Hmm. and in that such a commission he wrote that the muslims of the india are worstly worstly hit uh, by the uh, by by the indian that political mechanism so they have so much fault right, lines right. now not only fault lines internally domestically or regionally but internationally hmm. today today there are two policies in the uh, global policies that is asia pacific hmm. and global pacific indo indo asia pacific they are not they have no role hmm. in that and secondly the the obr is a new world order they are irrelevant in that hmm. and in 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 the theory of uh, globalization or right. interdependence hmm. Hmm. if they will not be on the board hmm. what china is doing in the region or internationally as an emerging a uh, superpower of the world hmm. they will be they will be even irrelevant in the global phenom- phenomena also right, right. so it is an trilateral trilaterally what peer policy makers are doing it will not benefit even the uh, m- even the uh, community of the india hmm. and overall overall uh, the masses of the region right and and mr kamar uh, recently uh, the embarrassment that india had to face at uh, ladakh after that we also saw how indian media took up the case against china against pakistan and interestingly it is interesting to see that it is actually now india that is being isolated in the region we see they have that they don't have amicable relationship with pakistan with china nepal uh, bangladesh sri lanka for that matter what is going on with india at the moment and how is 
Indian government, Indian media reacting to this situation? Well, I think uh, the important factor which needs to be uh, remembered in this uh, 15 June saga where uh, um, uh, 20 Indian soldiers got killed and 10 were uh, taken away by the Chinese. I think without firing a single bullet, the Chinese took away the confidence of the 1.4 billion Indians. So remember, it was an Indian media machine. It was that jingoistic media which Indian... Right, I think that, yeah, right, there was some kind of uh, technical issue with the with uh, the call with Dr. Rasul talking about the situation, the embarrassment that India faced with, uh, with, uh, with China. Do you think that India would want to look for an opportunity where they can vent out this embarrassment that they faced with China? Actually, it is an interesting story. First of all, they told you that none have been killed. Then they accepted that three, an Inkuru colonel, has been killed. Then they accepted 20. And then after all, 10 more, one colonel, three majors, and seven soldiers has been released. The vulgarity of the India has been badly hit. Number one. Number two, after all, he ultimately surrendered that no land of our has been occupied by the China. And second day, the ambassador of the India in the China said that no, they are in the Galwan Valley and our DOBD road is under 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 the control right. of the Chinese. So you know what they have raised a big a big umpire on the basis of the hawks of the media that has been demolished in, a, in, in some seconds right. by the China. And it also made India vulnerable what they were talking a big it was nothing there there is a big security vacuum and they are nowhere existing. Right. And now you see that in international relations, we say if you don't have interest in any other nations, you will not move forward. Now, China has the interest in the region. Hmm. She is building a mega road structure, not only but the maritime silk road also. Now, she, she had made a road in Sri Lanka, in Bhutan, trying to uh, through Bhutan also, which has been stopped by the India and again in Nepal mm. and Bangladesh, she has now virtually practically the interests in the region. Mm. And same is the situation with the Pakistan. So if you will see that a new situation is emerging and that is hope also internationally for we people. Right. That more we say, more you have the relations, more you have the close uh, closeness. And more there is closeness, more there is possibility of chain gauging and buck passing, we say it in international right. relations. Right, right. Mr. Kamar, talking about this whole situation, there is this big lie, this facade, this propaganda that is knitted by the Indian media. Of course, there are sane voices as well inside India. Do they buy this kind of narrative that Hindutva media is selling to its people, that this media owned by BJP and RSS is selling to the Indians? Do they buy it? Well, I think definitely they buy, but uh, as you were mentioning about this uh, China uh, situation yeah. that how things got shaped, I think uh, without, uh, you know, firing a single bullet uh, mm. and without no media support uh, from, from China because uh, they didn't explain their position on media or mainstream media or the social media, the Indians lost confidence in front of Chinese and that was a classical example that with the absolute strategic communication, with all the tools of the strategic communication, with all the support of the domestic audience to China. And that is because the Indian government and the Indian political leader 24, 28 hours to, to respond what happened uh, to uh, neither the defense Right. I think there is some technical issue. Right. Wrongly that the happened. Mr. Shima, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Rasul, pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for, for joining us and thank you for discussing Kashmir with us. Thank you. That's all from today's Views on News. The thing is, the Indian atrocities and the way they are committed in India, in, in Indian occupied Kashmir each and every moment. We recently saw how a grandfather was killed in front of his grandson by the Indian police. Now, the whole 
job of the Indian media was to fabricate the whole incident that happened. Of course, they can tell lie to their people, they can produce this disinformation, but in this age of media, nothing is hidden. It came out and the child himself told the people, to the, told the world about what actually happened. This continues. The world has to take a stance on uh, stopping the Indian atrocities in Indian occupied Kashmir. We took Mr. Andy Vermont from Belgium with us. He also said that the European Union, which stands for human rights, which is the defender of human rights, this is the time for European Union to take a stand, to take a stance on thwarting, on stopping the Indian atrocities in Indian occupied Kashmir. Thank you for watching today's Views on News. See you next time. Khuda